our next session uh, starts with uh, a talk by Henrik Zinkernagel, who will be uh, telling us about time, aesthetics, and the limits of cosmology. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks very much for the invitation to the organizers. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, today I will talk, as you can see, about time, aesthetics, and the limits of cosmology. And I'll start talking mostly about time and limits of cosmology, especially uh, temporal limits of cosmology. And then in the second part, smaller part of the talk, I'll uh, connect that. First of all, I'll talk a little bit of aesthetics in science and try to connect that to the limits. OK. And as you can see, this is partly based on joint work with uh, Sven Ru, who's also here. OK, so I thought I would start with uh, Plato. Um, Plato wrote a book about 2,500 years ago, uh, the Timaeus, who uh, in a way is the first uh, scientific cosmology book. So I thought it would, would be appropriate to take it here. And it's 2,500 years old almost. And yet, uh, Platonism is very much still alive. Platonism is the idea that we can grasp the essentials of the universe in terms of a few unchanging laws. And we have seen uh, various examples also in this conference, in this conference of um, people pursuing precisely that, finding a few, a set of, of basic laws to describe the entire universe. Uh, and I brought a quote uh, of Plato. We don't know if you look like that, but he might have. Um, which is a bit complicated, so I have inserted a few uh, explanations in between. Nevertheless, I'll try to read it uh, with you and see what we can take out of it, because I think Plato is relevant, both for time and cosmology today, and also for the general cosmological scene of today. So here's a quote. It's in the Timaeus. The craftsman, the craftsman, or the demiurge, sought to make the universe eternal so far as might be. So he wanted to, to make the universe eternal. Now the nature of the ideal being, the world of ideas, was everlasting. But to bestow this attribute in its fullness upon a creature, the universe, was impossible. So the craftsman wants to create something. He wants to make it eternal, but he cannot because it's created. So he wants to do it uh, something else. Wherefore, he resolved to have a moving image of eternity. And when he set in order the heaven, he made this image eternal, but moving according to number, which is roughly revolutions of the sun or of the planets, while eternity itself rests in unity. And this image of eternity we call time. So eternity rests in unity in the one, and then time is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rotations of the sky. The interesting point here about uh, this quote, in, in the first, uh, firstly, is that this, this idea of time as a moving image of, it, of eternity, it's regular, it's stable, so it's eternity, it's always coming back to the same. And if you read this quote in context with the rest of, of, uh, of the dialogue, you will see that um, Plato is also suggesting that time is intimately related to order. Because Plato does not have a creator ex nihilo. He does not have a creation from nothing, but rather a transition from a pre-cosmic disordered state with only chaotic motion. And that pre-cosmic uh, pre state has no time in it. And so there's a whole uh, scholarly debate among uh, Plato specialists about whether, uh, what exactly Plato meant to say, whether he's consistent, I think one can make a fair, fair case that it, that it does make sense that simply the pre-ordered, the, the pre-cosmic state is simply so disorganized that there is no evolution, there is nothing happening there, so there is, in this sense, no time. Anyway, that's not the important point. The important point here is we can deduce from this what I would like to call Plato's principle, which is no time without ordered motion. And the interesting thing, I think, is that this principle uh, re-emerges in modern relativistic cosmology. So now let's look at modern cosmology. Actually, this is a bit of an old picture, but I like it. So uh, it's still there, even if the numbers are not quite right. Um, so we are sitting there 14 billion years after and looking back. And we ask um, what well, we know, that physics become more and more speculative the further we go back in time. 
But the question I want to ask here with Plato in mind is whether, we, whether the time concept we used to go backwards with is still well defined in our backwards extrapolation. Now, in order to answer that or to look at that, we will have to see on how cosmic time is defined. And as you well know, in general, there is no global time in general relativity. But in the standard cosmological model, the friedman limitzer robertson walker model, with a global time uh, parameter, that model can be derived if we make two assumptions. And I want to spell them out here because they're not always spelled out, both of them. Uh, some books of cosmology, they do it. Uh, other cosmology books, they don't. But I think it's, it's worth doing it here. The first of these assumptions is what is known as Weyl's principle, which roughly says that the world lines of fundamental particles, which could be galaxies, they form a bundle of non-intersecting geodesics orthogonal to a series of space-like hypersurfaces. And these are these hypersurfaces here. So the galaxies or the fundamental particles early on, they form a, a bundle or uh, congruence of these non-intersecting geodesics. And this series of hypersurfaces is what allows for common cosmic time because it allows us to split, to write the metric uh, in this form where we have split out the, the t and the, and the x variable. And these non-intersecting world lines, the galaxies here, they carry the co-moving spatial coordinates. What the wild, wild principle is doing is setting up the co-moving coordinate frame for us. And so what the wild principle, wild principle does is to make a constraint on the motion of the matter content, just in a way like Plato's principle. In fact, as you can find in a standard book on cosmology, if two galaxy world lines did intersect, the coordinate system would break down, because then you would have two spatial coordinates describing the same point in space-time. Of course, this picture is only, only right on average. Real galaxies, they do collide. We know that. But on average, you should be able to find such a family of, um, of, of geodesics in order to set up your cosmic time. Now, the second... Uh, principle is the cosmological principle, which is often used, uh, mentioned just the cosmological principle, which says that the universe is spatially homogeneous and isotropic. And that puts a constraint on the distribution of the matter content. But note that if you want to say uh, what isotropic means, you will have to say isotropic with respect to what system. And this is precisely what Wiles principle is giving you. That's why you need them both. OK. So. Let's like, take a slightly uh, more detailed look on, the, uh, on this relation between time and, and, and matter there. So both the Weyl principle and the cosmological principle, in fact, both needed to set up the standard model of cosmology and define a cosmic time. They refer to the physical constituents of the universe. And this means that the definition of cosmic time is related to, or in fact depends upon, the behavior of the material constituents of the universe. And it's also so that the required behavior of the material constituents of the universe seems to be a classical behavior. We have some well-defined trajectories here in space-time. And it's not at all clear how some entangled quantum constituents or some wave function, what have you, could produce this picture of non-intersecting geodesics. And so I think it's worth making the point that the definition of cosmic time hangs on classical and well-behaved material constituents in standard cosmology. OK. So with this in mind, we can ask, how far back in time can we extrapolate our model? And here is a rough timeline, just to scale. Um, and we are here now. And there are several interesting points along the line. But I'll just talk about a couple of them. So the first point where one can worry, where I will worry just a little bit, I'll just mention it, is when we reach the Higgs. Uh, or the electroweak phase transition at about 10 to the minus 11 seconds when we move backwards. Uh, 10 to the minus 11 seconds after the Big Bang, but we're moving backwards as well. So before the electroweak phase transition, known physics becomes scale, become scale invariant, so one loses any handle or any non-speculative handle on how close we are to the singularity. We have no scales before this point, at least not if we stick to standard physics. It might, of course, be... Sorry? General relativity is not scaling. What's the scale in, in, in general relativity? Well, the the Planck mass. Is that general relativity the Planck mass? Well, I, I, okay, I'm assuming that non physics includes quantum physics. Um, 
if we're just doing general relativity, we don't have a mass, we don't have a mass scale as yet. Um, anyway, so, so OK, I'll not talk a lot about this. But at least in standard, if you just stick to general relativity, with the physics we know, then at this transition, we hit, we hit uh, a scale invariant phase. And this is, for instance, what, what Penrose uses in his cyclic uh, cosmology that there comes a scale or even a conformal invariance above this point. Now, if a period is reached when all constituents are quantum, say at the onset of inflation, say 10 to the minus 25 seconds, then how can well defined and non intersecting particle trajectories be identified? And this is linked to what one could call the cosmic measurement problem, which uh, we just heard a talk uh, by Sudarsky about, uh, in fact, about this problem. And finally, we may ask, OK, whatever you think of these two, certainly most people would agree that something uh, strange happened, or at least there's no known sensible time concept before the Planck time, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And there it seems, then, that we have some kind of limit to how far we can go back. That is, of course, including uh, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics. And if you don't, well, then you, you hit uh, the singularity. OK, so here are at least some things to worry about, some places where we might hit a temporal limit in our backwards extrapolation of time. Now, I want to say a little bit more about the cosmic measurement problem. The cosmic measurement problem says that if the universe was once and fundamentally is, quantum, and we can call this a little provo provocatively, but I think it's OK, to call that quantum fundamentalism. If this is so, then how come that there are classical structures now? How do systems, for instance, particles with definite positions, arise which are well described by classical physics? And uh, it's well known in, in the literature that you will find various steps of classicality. First problem, of course, is how to get a classical space-time out of a quantum space-time space-time in, in square quotes, because we don't know, of course, what that looks like or what, what that would be, or even if you can derive something space-time-like from something which is not space-time. That's quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. The second problem is how to get classical structures from quantum fields once you have a classical space-time background. How do you get quantum fields to classical fields? For instance, how do you get quantum fluctuations to density perturbations in the CMB? That was uh, the talk by Sudask we just heard. And other, also, other people have, of course, worked on this as well. And also, one can ask a related question. I mean, how do we get from quantum fields to classical particles with well-defined space-time trajectories? And finally, one might ask how to get a quantum mechanical measurement apparatus to show definite results. That's just the standard measurement problem, which, of course, occurs all along the way, because there are quantum constituents also now, of course. So let's take a look at the cosmic timeline again. Usually, one would say, Things like the, more, the further we go back in time, the more quantum it becomes. Of course, there's quantum all the way. There's also quantum mechanics where we are now, obviously. But it seems as it gets more quantum uh, onset of the inflation, at least, and, and definitely quantum uh, gravity. And on the other hand, you're supposed to have some kind of emergence of classicality within this picture. But the question stands still, namely, is cosmic time well-defined in this quantum fundamentalist picture. That is, assume that everything is quantum. Can you then derive cosmic time? Or can you even talk about, in a sensible way, this scheme where you are going back and forth in cosmic time? Um, here again is the cosmic measurement problem, the first two steps. Classical space time from quantum cosmology and classical structures from quantum fields and classical space time. Now, like the standard quantum mechanical measurement problem, as we know, and we just heard that also from Daniel, decoherence is not enough. It cannot be the whole story. Uh, basically, uh, as in standard decoherence, you have a system, you have an apparatus, you have an environment, you uh, trace out the environment, but you still have a superposition. And so according to quantum mechanics, you cannot uh, interpret, or you cannot say that any of the subsystem is in a different state, in a, in a definite state. And so you still have, um, you still have the problem. And also, and more important uh, maybe in this context, if decoherence is to provide the classical structures, it cannot, as in standard environmental induced decoherence, be a process in cosmic time. Insofar as classical structures, these non-crossing world lines that I was talking about, are needed from the start to define cosmic time. That is, the idea is, 
if decoherence is what is supposed to give you the classicality, and that's supposed to happen in cosmic time, then that cannot be right if cosmic time already presupposes classicality. And note that this is inter interpretation independent. Any interpretation of quantum mechanics will, of course, need a cosmic time concept in order to address, in order to be relevant for the early universe. Early is a temporal word. An early universe is something we define in terms of cosmic time. So, quantum fundamentalism, the idea that everything is quantum, assumes that classicality emerges from an original quantum state in the early universe. But any discussion of the early universe requires a cosmic time concept. I'm sure we can agree on that. The setup of a cosmic time in the standard model suggests that this cosmic time must be understood in relation to classically behaved physical bodies. These world lines that we're talking about. And so it seems that there must be throughout cosmic history physical systems described along classical lines in contrast to quantum fundamentalism. And that's a brief, I think, pointer to Bohr's point. Bohr had been brought up in a, in a number of talks and uh, I do think, like uh, Simon mentioned, that sometimes Bohr is uh, confused with Copenhagen. Copenhagen in the sense of, uh, of observers observing, uh, and since there are no observers in the early universe, then this cannot be right. Bohr did not say that. What he said was that you would always, you can describe everything quantum, but you cannot describe everything quantum at the same time. You will always have to have something which is not described quantum. And the, the split between the two, you can, you can shift it, but you don't need an observer. Anyway, this was not about Bohr, this was just a, a comment. If one believes that everything is quantum, then one has a problem with time, and not only in quantum gravity. That's sort of the, the message I want to get across here. I just want to, just that you don't think it's only, it's just me, I want you to compare this to Vilenkin in 2002, uh, who commented on the situation in quantum cosmology, and he says the following. In a universe where no object behaves classically, that is predictably, that is regular. No clocks can be constructed. No measurements can be made. And there is nothing, for instance, the wave function of the universe, which he talks about in the live before, to interpret. OK. So I have been insisting a lot on this wild principle. And I'm sure that some of you would think, ah, do we really need that? Well, let's have a look. Because Weil's principle, of course, gives us a, a co-moving reference frame where, we can, where all observers have the same time. But maybe we could do it a little less than that. Maybe we could just think about a local observer who can sort of extrapolate back in his own proper time, for instance. Wouldn't that be good enough to go back further backwards in time? So the suggestion would be something like this. You attempt to construct a notion of time and cosmology associated with the past of a single event, here and now, for instance, by looking at the proper time defined in this way, along some particle time like world line uh, gamma with some uh, four velocities u there. Now, this approach, of course, uh, assumes that we know the metric here and that there are well-defined four velocities. And the question then becomes whether you can construct such world lines always, all the way back in the history of the universe. And when I say construct, I mean whether they can be physically realized as opposed to merely mathematically defined from the available constituents in the universe. For instance, can they be constructed from a scalar field, the inflaton field? And this question, as I will show in a minute, is also relevant for speculations about an infl inflationary multiverse. Basically, what, I, what I'm doing with this, with this question, as well as with the other questions, I'm following a, a fairly simple rule, which was, has been nicely put by uh, George Ellis in a recent paper, which is don't stretch equations beyond the limits of their validity. So when you use some equation to go backwards, make sure that the conditions to set up these equations are still satisfied. OK, so let's take a look at the multiverse. Clearly, here's, a, here's a, an old picture, but very, still very nice one, of Linda, uh, of the multiverse, where you see the bubbles forming. And he has a, a nice time concept out there, which is unspecified. Uh, so you would like to know, what is this time concept doing here? Because as you can see, almost by inspection, there's clearly no vile principle holding for the multiverse. They are crossing over these, uh, uh, if we take the blob stairs of world lines, and also uh, uh, these multiverses tend to be fractal, and you get all kinds of, 
of uh, funny effects. So there's not this nice regular behavior of the constituents in US spacetime. Uh, but the question was, could we not then use proper time to address the past of the onset of inflation, for instance? So we could think about, the on if we are this red bubble here, the onset of inflation will be down here in the, in the black here, and we can think about, can we not use it just a, a little proper time there to go back uh, uh, into the past of a, of a new bubble universe? Well, I don't think that's that easy. Uh, at the birth, as far as I understand, at the birth of a new bubble universe, the inflaton field is entirely dominated by Planck scale quantum fluctuations. That's what you can read, uh, for instance, in, in Linden in 2004 and in many other places. It's fluctuating wildly. And that means that the idea of trying to construct from the inflaton field some well defined classical world line trajectory is not at all clear. And thus, it's not clear that we can still talk about the past of that event. And we try to discuss that in a paper in more detail in, uh, in a recent paper with Rue. OK. So from all this, I gather that there seems to be some limits, some temporal limits, as to how far back a physical notion of time can be extrapolated. And I've at least identified a couple of, of places where you might look uh, a little more closely to see whether you can actually still go back in time from that point onwards. 10 to the minus 11, no scales. 10 to the minus uh, 35, onset of inflation. While quantum fluctuations, very hard to construct uh, uh, good trajectories. And 10 to the minus 43, of course, the Planck scale. So OK, with this in mind, with this sort of suggestion for some possible limits of how far we can push our cosmology, I'll turn to my second subject, which is cosmology and aesthetics. Um, we already heard a little bit about it, though not much. Here is a picture of how the Greeks looked at the universe. Uh, so it's a very clean and nice picture. We are here in the middle, of course, and everything around in, in, um, in, in, in spheres. Of course, some of the models were more complicated, but there, this was a, a sort of a common simplified view of what was going on. And we heard from Jean-Philippe the other day uh, that the word cosmos actually means, it can mean different things in Greek. It can mean order, but it can also mean adornment. And it can mean even order universe. But this adornment is, is sort of the interesting thing here. Because that's what uh, makes it the case that, for instance, cosmology and cosmetics have the same origin. Um, and as Jean-Philippe suggested, maybe it was Pythagoras who introduced the word cosmology. And we certainly know about, cosmology, about Pythagoras that he was very impressed by harmony and musical beauty. So much so that he thought that the beauty and the harmonies in music were also in the universe. He actually used that as a theory of the universe, uh, finding the uh, number ratios between uh, 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 harmonies and thinking that they were also applying to the universe as a whole. So he used aesthetics, as it were, to generate an idea of how the universe is working. So much so that he uh, created uh, what is known as the sphere, uh, sorry, the music of the sphere, of the spheres, sort of a cosmic music that we unfortunately just don't hear because we're so used to it. Now, now this project, with the, we laugh about it today, uh, the music of the sphere, but even Kepler uh, pursued this project many, many years later. And that might even help, have helped him to his third law. But anyway. The point is that cosmology was born as the science of the harmonious, the symmetric, and the beautiful, the science of a finite and well-ordered cosmos. And not only was cosmology born like that, but modern science was born like that, because the idea behind modern science is that we can actually capture things in a nice, orderly, symmetric, well, maybe not symmetric, but at least a nice, finite, and orderly way. We can describe the whole universe, as we saw uh, as I commented on Plato in the beginning, Plato takes, on, uh, takes over a lot of, of uh, Pythagoras' thoughts, in fact. So aesthetics lies at the very origin of cosmology and even in the definition of the word. And beauty in the form of simplicity, symmetry, and elegance of explanation has been a guiding line in cosmology and in science ever since. 
Many of you have referred to beauty, and there are numerous books uh, on uh, fundamental physics and cosmology where aesthetic criteria are all over the place, not least in string theory. Um, OK, so there's definitely a relation between cosmology and aesthetics. But now, the interesting thing here is that there is more to aesthetics than just beauty. Uh, the aesthetics also includes what is known as the sublime, which relates, for instance, to what is overwhelming, or infinite, or even that which may be beyond rational understanding. And the key character which introduced that in cosmological thought was Giordano Bruno in the Renaissance. Uh, we know that Bruno is famous for the idea of the infinite universe, but Giordano Bruno is also the first in the Renaissance who insists that beauty is not something which can be captured in a formula. It's not just uh, some symmetry requirements or some pro uh, uh, nice proportions or some harmonies or something like that. No, Bruno thought that beauty is much more, a much more uh, uh, open concept, as it were. Much more subjective, in fact. At the same time, as I said, uh, and as you know, Bruno was one of the first to contemplate the idea of a an infinite universe, which is rather striking that uh, the infinite universe comes in the same on the same time, at the same time, and by the same man who also makes this shift in aesthetics. And I think, actually, uh, that one can find more of these examples in the history of cosmology. And from that point on, cosmology is not only the science of the beautiful, but it's also the science of the sublime. The science in, in Bruno's idea, the science of, the, of uncountable island universes extended towards infinity. OK. So um, everybody knows that Bruno was burned at, st uh, at stake in, in Rome in the year 1600. And often, Bruno is taken up as sort of a martyr for science, because he defended his infinite universe in spite of, of, of the church being FM and all that. Uh, uh, Bruno scholars are, are less certain on that story, and they would usually say things like, well, probably it was more because he sort of doubted the virginity of Mary and the divinity of Christ, which was probably much more problematic for Bruno than, uh, than him insisting on the infinite universe. But what is interesting with, about Bruno is that what he's challenging is order. The idea of order, and especially as an aesthetical category. Until this point, most aesthetics has been within this order scheme, like finite, beautiful, nice, well-behaved, well-proportioned. OK. So let me just uh, give you an example of what the aesthetics of an infinite universe would be. And to that, let me just mention first an Englishman, Edmund Burke, who has one of the first uh, discussions about the sublime. And he points out, out, on the, he points out something very uh, striking, namely that the ideas of eternity and infinity are among the most affecting we have. Among the most affecting we have. And yet, perhaps, there's nothing of which we really understand so little as of infinity and eternity. And this was taken up by Kant and many others. <coughs> other people also discussed it. But the interesting thing is that, of course, many other people have said things very similar. David Hilbert, for instance, has uh, uh, stated uh, something very similar to this. And so if Berg is right, then no wonder that the multiverse idea is so attractive to many modern day cosmologists. Of course, I'm not saying by any means that we only have aesthetics as a criterion. Of course not. That's not the point. Uh, um, but Aesthetics is about what moves us to do certain things and what moves us to pursue certain ideas. Anyway, I think it's uh, interesting to note that an infinite universe is not automatically aesthetically attractive, a point which has been made by Bersinelli. If the spatial infinite, for instance, is merely an indefinite repetition of what is already known, it might well stop to surprise us. And even a multiverse in which everything that can happen always happens may be boring in the end. Personally, nothing really happens in a world where everything always goes on infinitely often. It seems that spatial infinity, in order to perceive, be perceived as a fascinating concept, has to main, maintain some kind of element of selected variety and genuine surprise. All of this just to say that it's not just uh, because it's infinite, then something is, is, is attractive. 
course not. And of course, also, again, there are other criteria we have, far stronger in order to decide whether uh, something is right or not. Okay. So you might think at this point, okay. So I have given you a few historical examples, uh, talked a little bit about Berg and, and these people. Is this, is this just a historical curiosity? Does aesthetic really matter? I think it does. Well, let's start with Plato. Here's what he says in one of his dialogues, not the uh, Timaeus, but the Symposium. Only in the contemplation of beauty is human life worth living. A rather strong statement. But nevertheless, something which uh, he's not the only one who has said. And perhaps we could add that for Plato, the most beautiful of, of all creatures was the universe itself. And so if you're a cosmologist, you should be on the safe side. And Plato's point still resonates among scientists. Here's just one example, but there are many others. And now to go a little bit outside of cosmology, here is uh, Rachel Carson, a uh, marine biologist and ecologist, who said, those who dwell as scientists or laymen among the beauties and mysteries of the Earth, we could suppose uh, say the universe as well, are never alone or wary of life, which is basically also uh, Plato's point, but now with both beauties and mysteries involved. Um, Plato had beauty in this category of, of the, of the well-ordered. And perhaps you will excuse me that I now make a slight detour also to popular culture and try to bring, in order to try to bring home, home the point about why aesthetics matter. Uh, from the film Dead Poets Society, starring, uh, starring uh, the late Robin Williams, there is a scene in the film where he is uh, explaining to his students of poetry why it's worth studying poetry, why it's worth reading poetry. And this is what he says. We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we're members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. And medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, and love, these are what we stay alive for. I think we can easily, and I don't think Mr. Keating would have objected, if we were to extend the reference to poetry also to the poetic and the mysterious aspects of science. And the point I'm trying to make is that we don't just do science in order to make a living. Certainly we do that. But we also do it because we're moved by something. And of course, many of you are using these kind of uh, ideas in popularization, but I think uh, the film Dead Poets Society makes clear that it's also a very uh, good uh, strategy in educational contexts uh, about stressing uh, these uh, aesthetic aspects. So I do think that aesthetics matter. So let me um, try to mention why the idea of not having a complete theory. We've heard at various points in this conference about the search for complete or final theory. Don Page and others have sort of uh, mentioned uh, that as a, uh, as a goal. Um, so I want to tell, uh, uh, I want to give you a quote of, of Niels Bohr. Um, and it's a very long quote, so I'll only give, it, give you the last part of the quote, but I will tell you what, what the rest of the quote is about. It's in 1928, Boris talking to his students' friends in a sort of a, an anniversary, and he's saying in 1928, just after quantum mechanics have uh, been formulated, that the, at this stage at least, uh, it is as our thoughts, uh, there's some kind of infinite wall in front of it, or in front of us. To the extent that we can always go around and try to explore new ways and find new things and new insights, but we can never actually cross it, this wall. And so he ends the quote like this. We are subject to a constantly growing impression of an eternal, infinite harmony. The harmony itself can, of course, only be dimly perceived, never grasped. At any attempt to do so, it slips according to its very nature through our fingers. What Boris is saying is that we cannot really get our hands on that ultimate thing there. Now, the reason, one of the reasons I'm taking this up is not uh, just to make a mention of Bohr, but because his, uh, his famous uh, opponent, Einstein, seemed to agree with this. Here's Einstein just two years later. The most beautiful thing we can experience 
is the mysterious. It's the source of all true art and all science. And though he, then he goes on to tell you that if you can't see that, then you're as good as dead. He to whom this emotion is a stranger can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. Now the interesting thing here is that Einstein is not saying that the most beautiful thing you can have is the final explanation. No, he's saying that the most beautiful thing you can have is the mystery. I think that's kind of uh, interesting. At least. So there might be, as I say, beauty in not having a final or complete theory. Even though, of course, we know that Einstein was searching for one. Einstein said many things, and so did Bohr. You can also pl always play around with the, with the quotes, of course. OK, so I've uh, reached my end, and I think that's what I should. So here's a very brief summary and a conclusion where I'll try to link the two parts. So first I was trying to say that whether there could be a temporal limit uh, to cosmology. Well, before the electroweak phase transition, known physics becomes scale invariant, and then we lose all handle on how close we are to the singularity. Um, if all constituents are quantum, at the onset of inflation, say, it seems hard, if not impossible, to satisfy Wilde's principle and Plato's principle, or even construct a physical notion of proper time along individual world lines. Classical system seems needed throughout cosmic history. If quantum gravity sets in at, say, 10 to, the, well, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, there seems to be no time concept before this Planck time. So here, at least, are some suggestions for possible limits, temporal limits, for cosmology. And of course, if you take away the quantum stuff, you're still stuck with the singularity, of course. So are such limits an embarrassment? Well, not necessarily. I'm not saying we should tr not try to come across them, but the fact if it is a fact, that there will always be something beyond our rational understanding, may be aesthetically attractive, if not also comforting. In any case, of course, there's no problem. I'm not arguing in any way there's any problem in searching for complete theory. The road may very well be covered with fascinating new insights, even if the end of the journey is never reached. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henrik, for a very timely talk. Um, perhaps there are uh, questions. Yeah. Um, I was pointing to Tim, sorry. Uh, Ofer there is a point which I think has not been discussed seriously at this meeting, uh, that the universe has actually experienced two phases of acceleration, namely inflation and the late time dark energy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can just take it as, well, that's what happened, or look for something deeper. I just wonder from your perspective or of aesthetic, simplicity, or lack of, what you're, what you're thinking about this? No, I, I don't think I have any particular aesthetic about, uh, say, to say about the uh, uh, possible second, second phase of, of, of the of the expansion. I don't think so. I mean, there was once the, the, the struggle to find some kind of symmetry principle, some kind of grand symmetry principle will, will, which would crush all, uh, uh, I mean, which would set the cosmological constant to zero. But that's sort of uh, a strange thing to do nowadays because of, of, the, of the discovery of the, of the expansion. So there was certainly aesthetics in this search for, uh, <coughs> for finding a a zero vacuum, a zero cosmological constant. Tim Maudlin. So in your discussion of time, you went through two phases. The first was talking about wanting a global time, meaning a unique global time function that presumably had some nice, pretty properties, maybe easy to write down the equations in terms of. And one's immediate thought as well, that would be nice in the actual universe where none of these symmetries are exact. It's not, gonna, it's not in the cards. <laughs> Uh, we can live without it. And so then you went to the second idea, which is, seems more natural. The fundamental temporal structure is given by the proper time along trajectories. Mm -hmm. And then you said, well, I want not just for there to be these trajectories, but to be able to construct them. I want the, the, the physics of matter to be of the right kind to actually occupy, mm -hmm. is, is what I understood. When you, I, I don't understand why that, why should that be important? I mean, if I'm not trying, if I'm trying to somehow 
extend a notion of time back early, wh why does it matter whether they're occupied or not? If I believe the space-time structure is there, in, in a certain sense, the geodesics exist, they have a, they have a proper time length. It, m you might put it directly in this way, Minkowski space-time, you could say, well, there's nothing to construct anything from materially, it's a vacuum solution or any vacuum solution, but we think they have perfectly good spatio-temporal structures. So I understand it would be very hard to meet your criterion of constructing them, but why should I think that's a necessary thing to do to have a perfectly good definition? Okay. The idea is, the idea is to try to sort of physically ground, as it were, the concepts that we are using. You're absolutely right that in special relativity, we don't need that, usually, at least not in a standard formulation, because as Einstein told us, we have the clocks and the rods in order to set up our, uh, our, time, our space and time. So we don't need it there. But I do think that uh, if we have a physics which is so that it cannot even, even in principle construct these mathematical constructs, they are after all, if we're just defining them mathematically, then I would say, okay, so what, why is it a physical model and not a mathematical model? That would sort of be the, that would sort of be the idea. Sort of a, a kind of a physical grounding of our, of our theory. If I just said space-time structure is itself a physical structure. That I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Cormac Rafferty from Ireland again. <laughs> um, just I noticed um, Plato was dragged out into the light uh, both on both themes, one on the notion of time and cosmology and also on the notion of aesthetics and cosmology. And it's just, you know, a minor, a minor bleat, a minor moan, but you know, there is that theorem that says no matter what idea you have, you can always find a minimum of one Greek philosopher who said something that sounds very similar, you know? Yeah. Sure. And, yeah. and you know, oh, okay. the, the serious truth behind that is one has to look at with the context in which they were saying it and what Absolutely. universe were they talking about. I agree. About, you know, as, as I agree. Know, yeah. And okay. the other thing is I would say, you know, Plato himself, he mightn't be the best role model there because, you know, of that famous separation, and I'm no expert, but the separation of the world of ideas from the real world, et cetera, et cetera. And also, I think we now know that he was aware of things like, for example, the, um, the heliocentric model of Aristarchus and several people before him and rejected on, certain, on perfectly good grounds, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, th there's a whole lot of stuff in there. And I, there's always a temptation to say, well, this looks exactly like, like what we're saying, you know, but it's not. Look. But, but can I just, I mean, I mean, I agree with you, but of course, I mean, the basic aesthetic point of, of, of Plato, which was that it should, be, it, it should be understandable in sort of a few uh, laws, that, uh, I mean, he, he puts that problem to, to astronomy for 1,500 years, that we should be able to understand the planetary uh, motions from such a sort of a, uh, aesthetic criteria. Right, but my point is he said lots of other things we oh, wouldn't sure. agree with. Yeah, absolutely, that, that's, that's absolutely, thing. point taken. Uh, Simon Saunders, I, mean, I, I think Tim more or less said what I wanted to say, but perhaps I'll just back it up. It's a comment, really, that for those of us who are fairly relaxed about space-time structure without uh, an operational notion of time in terms of clocks and so forth, um, wouldn't, could you not put a place in there for the disappearance of light cone structure? Because that seems more the point at which there's a real problem with time. Uh, I mean, and, and look, related to... Um, but surely the microwave background offers a much better candidate for defining a cosmic time than does intersections of galaxies and so but forth. But not, not that far no, back. No, quite. It goes back to, to, the, to the last, uh, right, the last so to the disassociation right. period, absolutely. And prior to that, yes, it's problematic, but at least we have light cone structure, but go back sufficiently far and we lose even light cone structure. That ought to be on your, on your line, your timeline, I think. The, the CMB? No, when we lose time, light cone structure, right. which is in some, in some quantum gravity regime or other. Yeah. OK, sure. Are there additional questions? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I very much agree uh, your point about aesthetics and science. I think uh, aesthetics is one of the parts of the human culture and science included. But uh, on the other side, uh, I think uh, nature uh, sh does not care about beauty. Unless you assume a, a Pythagorical position, nature is uh, neutral. Uh, from, uh, uh, 
is not ca uh, looking for beauty. So if, if we scientists are uh, looking for some kind of uh, beauty, something like a simplicity or some uh, uh, prejudices that we have in our mind, maybe uh, we could uh, follow a, a wrong uh, direction to understand nature because we, we should uh, uh, forget in some, uh, our, our preferences by our aesthetical preferences to, to search for something uh, which will be uh, totally objective uh, away from human uh, worries. Mm. Well, I'm not saying that it's all aesthetics. That, that, that's the first point, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not getting rid of science no, sure, or sure. testability no, I, I, and, I and uh, yeah. the search for truth and all that. Not at all. I'm just saying that people are moved by these things. Sure. It might be good that they're moved. It might not be good, but they are moved. But this means that, in some sense, our science is uh, relative, in some sense. It, relative. To, to our culture, in some sense. It's influenced by our, our uh, concepts of beauty. I don't know. I mean, I mean, nobody, of course, would accept something. Well, maybe in the case of string theory. But apart from that, usually we don't accept things just for aesthetic reasons, right? We'll have to. Uh, oh. We have time for one more question. It's uh, 45, 45 here. <clears throat> I just was, want to comment, since you mentioned the difficulty of uh, thinking about time in that, um, that one of the uh, uh, big approaches trying to build a quantum theory of gravity, which is loop quantum gravity, is entirely constructed uh, uh, under the assumption that uh, uh, the fundamental theory doesn't need a, a time or continuous time, a unique time, in fact, time at all structure, nor a space uh, structure to emerge, to, 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 to be defined. So uh, the theory might work, but not work. Uh, team modeling might not be very happy. But uh, the, the, the branch of physics is trying to build a quantum theory of gravity um, in a way which uh, space and time uh, uh, effectively merge only in some approximation, in some limit, in some configuration, which of course covers m much of the universe that we know. Uh, but the idea is that you can do physics even uh, uh, sort of near the center of a black hole where matter actually falls, something should happen, or near the Big Bang where perhaps, uh, uh, we don't know, space and time uh, might not be good concept to describe what goes on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and it's of course great that people are trying that. I think there's a distinction between the black holes and, and the, the early universe, because at least in the black hole setting, you do have sort of a low, an object which is somewhere in a, in a sort of a more classical context, and you look at some quantum effects at some, at some smaller level. Right? That's not so clear that you can do that in the early universe, that there's sort of a, a classical, not a classical observer, but some kind of classical system around it. That's not so clear that you can find that in the early universe. We'll have to uh, draw this uh, to a close. Let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you.